the first speaker is Chris McDonald, who is uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Materials Processing Institute in Middlesbrough. So uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sue. Um, my sound is a little bit jerky from time to time. It's probably because I'm at home now and everybody's making use of the Wi-Fi. Um, so if it is a problem, if you put a note in the chat, uh, then I'll continue with the video off uh, and, uh, and that we could try that and that might work. Okay, so this evening we're having a, a discussion around hydrogen and the hydrogen economy. And I thought it would be interesting maybe just to say a couple of things about the various uses of hydrogen. One area of interest, which is primarily around industrial decarbonisation. And there might be one or two things that I'd like to say about hydrogen for transport as well. Um, so I guess people have been talking about hydrogen and the potential for hydrogen to displace oil for many decades. It's not a particularly new idea. Um, and in fact, the technology aspects of it aren't hugely challenging either. Um, I mean, it must be said the first time you mention uh, to the name and the idea of using hydrogen in transport, usually uh, what they think of is the Hindenburg disaster. Um, but we've come on quite a long way in terms of the handling of hydrogen uh, since that time. And in fact, it's an area where Teesside is over many decades in producing, um, transporting and using hydrogen. In fact, Teesside um, as many people realise, produces 50% currently of the UK's hydrogen need. And hydrogen has many roles, really, in decarbonising our economy as we, we aim for a carbon-neutral UK by 2050, or even earlier in many sectors. And hydrogen has the potential deca to decarbonise industry, heat, power and transport. Um, and there, there's a role that hydrogen could play in all of these areas. But to be successful, we really need hydrogen um, to, to, be, to be delivered across all of these sectors uh, almost simultaneously. So there has to be an integrated. The, for, for an industrial perspective, the, the, the major reasons to use hydrogen, where it's really not possible to decarbonize by other means. Um, so people would generally wonder why we wouldn't switch to using electricity. Um, and there are two good reasons for that. So one is where we need a gap for various reasons, and so we might currently use natural gas, and we could replace that with hydrogen. That could be a third fuel, for instance. And another reason might be for, to use hydrogen as a reductant, um, so where there is a, a chemical reason for using carbon um, to, rem to remove oxygen, hydrogen can perform that same role as well. So if I give you some examples of that, um, so traditionally in the blast furnace, uh, we would have used carbon to produce iron, uh, sorry, to, to, um, uh, to refine iron ore. Um, and we can replace uh, that carbon-based gas furnace process with a gas-based process, um, which uses uh, natural gas to produce a product called directly reduced iron. Uh, and a step on from that will be to replace the natural gas with hydrogen. Um, and similarly, in the glass sector, um, it's possible to conceive of hydrogen being used in gas purposes as an alternative to natural gas. So if we look around what's happening in the world now, what people are working on, well, over the last few years in Europe, a number of governments have made investments in the steel sector um, in enabling their domestic industries in Germany and in Austria um, to start investigating the use of hydrogen reduction. Um, but actually, SSAV in Sweden has probably made the greatest progress, and they aim to be producing zero carbon steel via a hydrogen process for the market by 2026. It was announced just a week or so ago um, that uh, HBIS Group in, in China aimed to have the world's first hydrogen directly reduced iron plant installed and ready to produce by the end of 2021. And the UK government's invested in a, a glass research centre um, at St Helens in the northwest, which will be looking at uh, hydrogen as a fuel for furnaces. So there is a lot of activity happening, and it's perhaps happening more quickly than we might have thought. Um, and then maybe just one comment about transport. 
Um, Teesside has recently been designated as the UK's hydrogen transport hub. Um, and one big opportunity for transport is around uh, buses, public service vehicles. Uh, there was an article in The Guardian just today about a, a trial of using hydrogen powered buses um, in Aberdeen. Um, and in fact, uh, Joe Bamford um, of JCB fame has been speaking on the radio about it today as well. And I'll post a link in the chat. Uh, to that radio program, uh, if people are interested in following up with them. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thanks very much for that, Chris. Uh, I'll pass on to uh, Gareth Fletcher now. Hi, <laughs> evening Over all. Over to you, Gareth. Hi, thanks. So, evening all. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, you might have noticed I disappeared. Oh came back that's because i swapped from one computer system to the other so can somebody give me a big nod, a nod if this is coming through all right yeah okay good good stuff right um sure quite a few of you I've, I've met before in one sort of place or other but that don't know me i'm gareth fletcher technology manager with tees valley combined authority again background 35 years in the steel industry and now sort of very very much involved in in kind of driving the uh, net zero agenda for Tees Valley and of course hydrogen is one big part of that and uh, I think when Sue asked me to do this talk it was very very much like you know bring us up to speed with what you're doing we know it's very relevant to hydrogen so that's what I've really tried to to do here probably for about the past year I've been heavily involved in what is effectively the Tees Valley's journey towards net zero and this really started back in Materials Processing Institute in 2018 when we we looked at the current competition for what the next industrial grand challenges would be. It's quite ironic that we put in a bid for £250 million for investment in Tees Valley to set up the National Hydrogen Centre here. That became part of the Industrial Decarbonisation Grand Challenge and we're currently working our way through that process. And for Tees Valley, that means two projects and potential funding streams and I'll emphasize the word potential because it's still kind of a bit under wraps but it's really what I've been doing with my life for the past year at work and there's two projects net zero T side which I strongly suspect has been discussed here before but very very briefly that is the deployment project to put a meaningful demonstrator on the ground and funding for that will be sought from UKRI to actually take that to the final investment decision and I think, as we're all aware, if that goes ahead, that is a dispatchable power station with full carbon capture on T side, which will then be linked with the process units CF and BOC, such that the capture plant's got a base load. And obviously, it's dispatchable power. The logic is when the wind's not blowing the power stations on. So that is the anchor on T's Valley to actually start the journey for decarbonisation. Where this gets interesting is what do we do around that? So we are putting together a cluster planning process, which really it's very much about the art of the possible. What could be done? Where would it be done? What technologies? And that's a project we're hoping to be able to make an announcement on shortly. And we're in the kind of final stages. But really what I wanted to do today was put up a, a few slides, which is very much along the lines of, you know, like, why do it here? You know, what is the Tees Valley? And I just thought that was quite a, an interesting topic. So, do you want to just kick the first one off, please, So, Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure some of us will have seen this and others others won't, but that's just a kind of Tees Valley in summary. And each of the, uh, the kind of captions, and I certainly can't read them, I suspect you guys can either, is a major industrial unit. Um, the ye yellow lines are the pipeline corridors, many of which I, th I suspect probably all of them have actually got hydrogen flowing in them. You look at the left hand leg going very, very much towards CF. Um, so that is what we're dealing with with the cluster. But if I had to summarise it, once upon a time it was British Steel and ICI, and of course the supply chains, but today it's very different. There's certainly a huge slug of process industry sits in there, which still includes steel and process chemicals, but what was once is now many. Um, the other thing that I think Teesside is, and we most don't notice, is, is also an energy business. We've got EDF, nuclear power station. Yeah, we all know about that one. There is a couple of power stations in ICI, which is Semco. Um, an increasing kind of waste to energy business with uh, partners such as Citroen against Semco. 
we've got MGT online biomass big energy and Teesside is also a net importer energy there's a big oil oil pipeline and right now I forget the the title and again we've got cats and I think cats is significant because cats brings in 16 percent of the UK's natural gas and that comes into export and that's a, a very very big pile of energy um, and I'm sure I got my terawatt hours to the power of 21 wrong when I tried to work out what was actually coming in um, and of course the other thing that's coming into Teesside is the two of the four outputs from the uh, four winds project on Dogger so very very much an energy island and of course the third leg for Teesside big harbour big, big port companies as the Amazon all the big names are using Teesport as well as the the kind of energy and raw materials in port so big big industry Teesside logistics power and process in the broadest terms plus their supply chains and I think that's really where we start getting into the decarbonisation challenge there's a, a kind of wider collection of new industries and bio in biomedical kind of like AI um, digital technology stuff but in some respects these guys are new smaller energy footprint and probably very very easy to deal with in terms of decarbonised ele electricity or heat through the gas networks so that's kind of if like the challenge how do we decarbonise this lot and the cluster planning project is aimed to come out with the answer Obviously, the key thing that we, we want to do with this is it's messaging to investors and it's messaging into to government as in why why do it here? And the other thing that's something we ought to ought to really mention is doing any of this stuff to decarbonise doesn't come for nothing. It comes at a cost. So there's a, a socialising it challenge, you know, like why would business want to invest? Because, you know, business isn't business just isn't going to invest because of the cost social responsibility report at these kind of levels so there is a very strong message to government comes through this that this needs to be supported and the next slide i put up just really give you guys a flavor of again some of the reasons why we should do it here um and obviously we start with ccs so location important let's do it on the north sea coast so we haven't got 30 or 50 miles of co2 pipe running through farmland built up areas etc etc Tees Valley is the most compact UK industrial cluster. It isn't the biggest. We no longer have a steelworks, um, but it's still quite significant. The moment, it's about 5 million tonnes per annum. It's not the 3.x that Bayes worked it out. We actually added it up recently. And of that 8.8, uh, 2 is uh, potentially net zero T side. So that's got a home. Another 1.8 is MGT. So it's very compact and there's a lot of CO2 comes from it and we've got quite a few big emitters still, even though we haven't got a steelworks. The cluster as a whole is very, very interconnected. A lot of that's the ICI legacy, which is still here today. We've got the kind of organisational connections through the Industrial Decarbonisation Group, which is an EPIC TVCA, plus all the industrial ops directors, industrial leads. So that gives us a, a body to coordinate and think. And, you know, these guys are right behind it. And of course, practically the infrastructure's there. There's already hydrogen storage, hydrogen pipelines, which are used every day, and the pipe corridors, and there's room for more. And of course, what that means for us, it kind of gives us a reason to attract new businesses, regenerate, revitalize, slugger jobs while we're doing it. And of course, it links straight through our local strategy and national strategy. So some definite reasons about like why we want to do this in Teesside. Now the last slide. So, and just some thoughts, and this by no means is a, a complete piece, um, but obviously very, very big emitters, power stations alike, const constant emission streams, the obvious answer is carbon capture and storage. Some of the smaller guys, it might not be practical to do carbon capture and storage, you know, like in isolation, but there may be merit in linking back together with shared aiming facilities or alternatively switch it to hydrogen. Again, for some of the harder to access, harder to treat dirty gases, again, maybe fuel switch it to hydrogen, electricity. Electricity be quite, could be quite imaginative. I mean, you know, you start thinking about miles and miles of canthal wire wrapped around a steel reheating furnace, probably won't work. Big induction furnace probably will, except in technology. So, you know, a few pieces there we've really got to get the bottom of. 
The other option, of course, is we currently have that major energy import on Teesside. Why don't we convert some or all of it to hydrogen? And I'm conscious Keith's following me, and I know Keith will say a lot more about that. I did a very, very quick fact packet calculation looking at Teesside's overall energy demand. And I'm not 100% sure the numbers are all right, but if you take a state of the art autothermal reactor uh, process at 400 megawatts, you could probably put a plant with two of those in because you never built one. And roughly a quarter of one of those would keep a third of our fired heaters in business across the cluster. So in some respects, it's it's not that big a challenge in an autothermal reformation, very really well accepted technology. I don't know whether it's proven at this scale, but it's certainly proven. So, you know, kind of thought piece in there. We could put some hydrogen creation cap capability, link it with carbon capture and storage and decarbonize the cluster. By putting a will scale plant in, that would give us the opportunity to decarbonize the cluster and export quite a significant quantity of hydrogen. Um, obviously, there's hydrogen and hydrogen, there's fuel cell grade hydrogen. The obvious way to produce that is electrolyzers, all, all a bit the other way, steam methane reformation and a, you know, a good clean up stage such that you don't poison the fuel cells. So bringing offshore wind in, there's obviously an opportunity there to convert electrons to molecules and store them. And of course, the other dimension to this is the use of hydrogen and storing it as ammonia, much greater energy density. So there's a few pieces in here. And I'm not going to say any more about them other than these are all like ongoing pieces of research work, more often ongoing, wait, you know, waiting for the opportunity to demonstrate at scale. So I hope that gives you a flavour of the cluster and some of the things that we're thinking and seeking to do. That's me, Sue. OK, thank you very much for that, Gareth. Uh, next person up is Keith Owen from... Uh... Are you just there as Keith, Keith Owen? Um... Uh, yes, I am. That seems to be how it's popped up, yes. Um... Right. OK, so over to you, Keith, for your few minutes. OK, thanks. You should be able to see that, I think. Uh, shout if you can't. Um, so I'll quickly yeah, run okay. through, I'll quickly run through uh, what GB Gas Industry is doing. So, um, uh, so there's there's an element of what NGN specifically, non gas networks specifically, are active in. But uh, I'll try and give a broader GB view first, uh, just so we can put that into context. So very quickly, if I spin the next slide up, as I say, we've got uh, a lot going on. Very quickly, this is Northern Gas Networks. Just to be very clear about where our patch is. So Berwick down to uh, down to Hull, across to uh, uh, the Lake Districts got a little bit of that and so forth. So quite a wide geographic area, a real mixed bag of coast to coast, some rural, some heavy city, uh, and just some quick sort of fast facts, I suppose, about uh, the, the sort of business that we're in. So I think the middle one's quite important. Uh, at the time that you need heat, uh, that, that's when our system is at its finest, I suppose. Uh, and what that's delivering uh, what you've got there is the amount of heat on a daily basis that we might um, push out of our system. That was, uh, if you remember, the beast from the east, as it was called. Um, uh, that's what we did on that day. And I think there's two really important points there. First is just the sheer amount of energy being pushed around uh, to keep people warm, uh, keep industry running, but also the storage element as well, which is uh, quite a large number. And that's just our little network. If you think about that from a national perspective, those numbers become uh, telephone numbers in the truest senses, really. So it just gives you an idea of what we do. Um, there's the national picture, just so we contextualize that more broadly. Uh, and what you've got there, the red line is electricity. That's what these are daily actual figures. This is not kind of forecast, make believe this is actual numbers. Uh, so you can see that what electricity is doing. The gray line is oil, uh, typically uh, transport. Uh, and then the blue line is what the gas industry is doing on a daily basis. So you can see they are very, very different. Um, uh, and that, you know, that poses a pretty big challenge to the UK. Um, we're, we're in a position at the moment where electricity is by and large, maybe it's about 50 percent decarbonized, uh, depending on uh, what, what's firing on a particular day. 
see that sort of 50% mark, that's only making about 20% of what we use in the UK. The other 80% is broadly split equally between oil and gas, which aren't decarbonised. So we've got 30 years to decarbonise the other 90%. <laughs> so it's, it's a hefty old challenge that we have ahead of us, uh, but but you know let's consider that an opportunity. Um, so gas industry, uh, we've got gas goes green, which was on the opening slide. Uh, we're driving an awful lot of activity through there. Uh, uh, you can see those six work streams because it's not just about the raw uh, geek speak, the technology, but also what it means to stakeholders, what it means to the consumer. Uh, questions around gas quality and safety and so forth. All these things are really valuable and important uh, and part of the overall solution. Um, beneath there, you can see a range of active projects that are happening in the UK right now. That's a real small snapshot. There's much, much more happening. I'll talk about H21 in a moment. That's our project. It, High for Heat's a government project, uh, £25 million of investment from government to appliance manufacturers and, and, and meter manufacturing. Uh, to develop hydrogen appliances, cookers, fires, boilers, hydrogen meters, uh, hot air blowers, these sorts of things. So from the domestic through to the sort of lighter end of commercial, uh, high for heat's covering at the moment. Uh, and there's some fantastic results coming out of there with dual fuel uh, fires, hydrogen hubs, uh, 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 hydrogen ready uh, boiler systems, really terrific stuff. Uh, you might have seen in the press today, uh, colleagues in Scotland, uh, the Scotia Gas Networks have uh, uh, had approval for their some of their high uh, their H100 work, uh, which is super. That's putting a brand new gas network in, uh, putting brand new appliances into a small village, uh, I think in East Fife, uh, and and proving the case for hydrogen for heat. Hynet is something that Cadent Gas ran with uh, our colleagues over in, uh, in the Midlands. Uh, and that is in the northwest, that big industrial cluster, looking at how hydrogen decarbonizes all of those major industries over there. High NTS is what we do with that backbone, that core spine of gas transmission system in the UK owned by National Grid, uh, and pushing hydrogen through that, which is the, you know, the challenges there around putting hydrogen in in uh, high grade carbon steels at high pressure. And that's something they're working on with uh, both themselves and tapping into Europe as well. Uh, High deploys our project along with Cadent Gas, blending hydrogen into the national gas into the natural gas system. The idea being, if we can get up to twenty percent, no impact on on uh, domestic appliances and so forth, but we get a six percent drop in carbon, so some positivity there. And then pulling all of that together is a really important one. Actually, is what does that mean for your energy bill? How, what what changes might be afoot if we start mixing gases up? changing the calorific value of that gas uh, and so on and so forth. So future billing methodologies are another national wide project where we're trying to understand a, a new solution to, to that billing process. A uh, little bit on H21, I'll just spin through these quickly because I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Been working on uh, the H21 programme for, for a little while. Uh, uh, for a time I was programme director, that's now handed over to a chap called Tim Harwood. Uh, to take the, the project further forward. Uh, and what we were doing there uh, in phase one, which I was looking after, was testing how our asset, our existing gas network assets would perform if we put hydrogen through. Big question, really, because nobody knew. Uh, uh, so over, over the, the past uh, year, 18 months, we've been harvesting uh, cast iron pipes, plastics, all manner of things from across the UK with the help of our colleagues in other gas businesses. Uh, and we've been testing them on that site on the left hand side there, which is the health and safety laboratory in Buxton. So we built that facility, you can see uh, it's quite unique. There's nothing like that anywhere else in the world uh, where we could test sections of asset first with natural gas, then test them with hydrogen and understand the difference in behavior in terms of leakage profiles and so forth. And then over at Spade Adam, which is the facility on the right hand side, a DMVGL uh, facility, there's some properties being created there. And the idea was to test what happens if hydrogen does escape. Uh, uh, how does it how does it track through soil structures, cocks of properties? How does it disperse? All of those, uh, again, really important questions. And all of this is a replication of work done when we moved from Towns Gas, ironically, which had 50% hydrogen in 
uh, to, to natural gas. So really important work and the, the findings from that will be published uh, Q1 next year, it says September. I did update that slide, but somehow I managed to forget my update. Uh, yeah, it's Q1 next year that report comes out, which uh, I'm sure will be eagerly awaited because that really provides a substantive amount of evidence for the ability of our network to be repurposed. Um, what we're doing now, which is, is a piece that Tim's running, we're, we're creating a microgrid at the Spade Adam site, so a replica of everything that we have. Uh, and, and again, just this week, we've been, been announced that National Grid have been awarded funding to put a high pressure system in there as well. So we'll have a 90 bar system all the way down to millibars into those properties where we can have it at natural gas and convert the whole thing to hydrogen and really test the test that rigorously to understand not just its performance, but how our policies, our procedures, our tools and equipment perform with this new family of gas. Um, the other phase to that is uh, uh, we've we've managed to secure with the great support of uh, guys at TVCA and, and indeed uh, uh, the local authority, uh, a site in, in uh, Middlesbrough, South Middlesbrough, I think, uh, which is an old housing estate, which the property has been removed, but the gas infrastructure is still perfectly intact. It was never, never removed, never decommissioned, still there. Uh, so we're capturing that. And what we're going to do is test all of our findings in phase one against this undisturbed gas network to really validate the science. Because we think this, we think the science is right. I think that's all very correct and proper. Uh, but having that final validation on something that's never been touched uh, uh, for a long time is really valuable to us. So we're, we're doing that as well. Uh, and then the phase three workers really start to think about how we do all of this, but with human beings involved, how we do an occupied trial, be small scale, tightly controlled, of course, uh, but a really important and exciting step. And you'll have noticed from the government's 10 point plan that, you know, they've got bold ambitions there to move from what is relatively small scale trials that we're talking about here to town scale conversion to hydrogen uh, uh, towards the end of this decade. So really exciting times to be in the gas industry. Um, just finally, to close out uh, a project that I'm leading on, uh, we've got uh, the Integral facility, which is a bit of a test sandbox uh, that we've been developing for a couple of years now, looking at how all of this works from a whole systems perspective. And what we're doing at the moment is first developing a, a hydrogen house demonstrator so we can bring cookers, fires, boilers, metering systems there. We can get them uh, get them running, have stakeholders come in and, and really normalize the conversation around hydrogen for heat. Because there's an awful lot of uh, strange things said about it. <laughs> uh, and we want to try and normalize that. Uh, this is credible and will, you know, will happen with a fair wind. Uh, and then the, the the future build out from that is something that's uh, pretty live at the moment, developer, what we're calling the Customer Energy Village, which is uh, uh, a representation of lots of different property types uh, that exist right now, because that's the real challenge. I'm not really too worried about future homes. I'm really interested in how we decarbonize all of the existing housing stock to that efficient, efficiently to the benefit of customers at, at least cost. That's that's where we're at right now. So I appreciate I've sprinted through that really quickly, but um, there is a great deal happening. So hopefully that's been useful to you. Uh, I was just saying we'll pass over to Graham Hillier now, if you'd like to uh, say your piece, Graham. Yeah, thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, I, since I've been retired, I've uh, not had a terrible lot to do with this, but but there's I, my history involves quite a lot to do with hydrogen. In the mid 1990s, I was the ICI Petrochemicals and Plastics. Well, petrochemicals, plastics, and fertilizers planning director, and my team used to plan the whole of the hydrogen system on Teesside, which clearly still exists and is part of, of Gareth's plans. And in the early days of the Centre for Process Innovation, I led the hydrogen and fuel cells team there. And we had about eight um, demonstrators that we used to run in the Tees Valley that stretched from running the South Gares uh, lighthouse on hydrogen, which we did for two, a couple of years through to uh, converting one of Nissan's Almeras, that's how long ago it was, to run on hydrogen and build it a filling station that could fill it up to about 250 bar of hydrogen. I also work quite closely with the EU and I was deputy chair of their hydrogen regions and municipalities partnership, which is one of the first highs, it was the high ramp program. Uh, and also was, was uh, worked hard at the beginning of the, the UK's Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Association. So. 
um, my working life's involved hydrogen quite a lot of the time. And fundamentally, it's a good thing, but the trouble is there are some big challenges to address. And what we mustn't do is, is lose sight of those challenges in our enthusiasm for this apparently easy to get at zero carbon fuel. And there are five things that I think we need to keep in our minds. There's the material itself, there's the energy and the mass balance of the system, there's the capital cost of the equipment, there's the operating cost, and then there's a the system and the resource efficiency. And if we look at each of them in turn, the material is not a naturally occurring gas. It doesn't lie around like most other gases and, and fuels that we use. Um, and it's the lightest element in the universe and it's very reactive and it bonds very strongly. And it particularly likes bonding very strongly to oxygen and to carbon. And the whole of our biological systems are related to, uh, to hydrogen and carbon bonds. So um, evolution has chosen hydrogen linked to carbon as a pretty important part of the way that the Earth works. So getting hold of hydrogen is not that simple, as the guys have already said. When you do burn it, it's, the flame's invisible, pretty much. And um, the, the stuff that Northern Glass Networks are doing is going to be really important in terms of proving that we can operate these things as, as safely as we need to operate them once we get to that point. Storing hydrogen is not trivially simple either because it's very light. So you have to pressurize it to pretty high pressures to get any sensible energy density. And even though it's an explosive gas, it's not probably the issue. It's the fact it's just a high pressure that we're looking at. If we want it liquid, we've got to cool it down to minus 253 centigrade, which is, again, not a simple thing to do and uses a fair amount of energy. And it does like escaping. Um, the other thing is that we always assume that it burns really cleanly and it does in, in pure oxygen. But if you're burning it in air, you've got quite a lot of nitrogen present. So your NOx emissions go up quite significantly. And that's something that really needs to be looked at quite hard because you might not be causing global warming, but you're potentially causing increased ground pollution. So those things need monitoring, too. So as a, as, as a material, it has more challenges than a lot of the things that we, we use at the moment. Nothing that's insurmountable, but things that need to be thought about. So the next point is this energy and mass balance point. You've got to get the hydrogen away from its oxygen and its carbon before you can use it. And that uses a lot of energy. And a lot of those processes aren't terribly efficient. So doing this chemical engineering thing of designing, defining your system and then working out what the energy and mass balance of how it works and the, the the mass or lack of it is is a huge challenge. Um, I think that a lot of the the processes and the, the core processes aren't there: gasifiers, steam reformers, and electrolyzers. And gasifiers and steam reformers produce us an awful lot of carbon dioxide. We do tend to assume that what we'll do is bury the carbon dioxide in the ground to store it. But when you think that human activity is producing about 21 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, burying it isn't really probably the best answer. Growing things is a fantastic opportunity. And the Tees Valley is in a wonderful position to combine energy and normal people with agriculture to look at how you can link all of those systems together. And it's something that we should keep in our minds, I think. So that energy and mass balance itself is quite a challenge and, and needs to be looked at right from the system point of view from one end to the other. Then that thing brings us on to the fact that the capital cost is also pretty high. <clears throat> you need, like we've already said, a huge amount of energy, and that means you need complicated equipment that's quite complicated, quite tricky to, to use. And it, it's not clear to me at the moment the capital cost of this kit will come down the higher the volume that we produce because we're looking at high temperatures and high pressures and, and high energy consumptions and, and often looking at difficult or complicated catalysts and fluorinated polymers in, in membranes and what have you in electrolyzers. So again, there's a potential for environmental damage outside of just saving carbon and that, that damage won't be in our space, it'll be somewhere else like Africa or China. Or, but it still needs to be thought about and it still needs to be joined into the system. Hydrogen pipelines are terribly expensive. There are a few of them in the northeast and there's a few of them in the northwest of the UK. The US has got thousands of miles of hydrogen pipelines and, and um, Netherlands and Belgium do too, but they're still not cheap. And this idea of blending hydrogen into gas is a really good way of, of dealing with the situation without having to spend an absolute fortune on, on loads of new 
piping. Um, so the capital costs high, and if we're going to change the whole system, the capital cost will be very high. And whether we can afford it is something that we need to think about as well. And then if we have afforded it, the operating cost is an, another big challenge for us. Electrolyzers use a lot of electricity, clearly, and they, they don't last very long. They don't have long lives and they don't like variable loads on them all the time, which is what we want to, to try to do to them. Gasifiers and steam reformers are expensive to run. They're, they, they're overhaul intense because of the nature of, of the equipment. So how you reduce that operating cost and if you're operating a carbon capture system, you're putting in a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of capital that's not bringing you much money back. So the fifth point and the most important one in my mind is that how do you design the system to get it as resource efficient as you can? And I think one of the things I don't see in many places, and I think there's an opportunity in the Tees Valley to do something about it, is to plan out that whole system, to look at the capital costs, to look at the efficiencies, to identify the Achilles heels and actually target how you fix those Achilles heels. Because as Chris said at the beginning, the technology is known and it works. It's a matter of how do you use it most effectively. And I haven't got time to talk about it just now, but, but in one of my roles, I do some work with Callaghan Innovation in New Zealand. Uh, and they designed a system um, using sun and wind and hydrogen and electricity for the South Sea Islands to make them independent. And they, they fundamentally, they stepped out of their of, of just changing the normal system to think about how could they most efficiently make a system that supported a remote community. And if anybody's interested, I'll take you through that, that later on. So my final point that summarizes all of this is there are big challenges in this system. We need to think about how that system works. We need to identify what those challenges are and we need to address them. Not just by doing demonstrators, because there are many demonstrators around the world. Europe, the HIRAP team in Europe did loads of stuff on buses and hydrogen communities. But as soon as the grant got taken away, they all got shut down because they weren't economically viable. <clears throat> and finding that opportunity to do these things as efficiently as possible, with as little environmental damage as possible, in a way that makes them economic enough that they do become viable alternatives, is the big challenge of the hydrogen economy. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, I'll just uh, make Professor Ross Gilly the uh, presenter now, and over to you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I think um, we have to go through a, uh, a transition to uh, net zero carbon. And there are a number of scenarios to achieve this by 2050 at the minimum. And um, all the indications from the uh, modeling work that's been fed into base is that hydrogen will play a significant role um, in the future, uh, whichever we take. Um, it uh, is unlikely that we will be in a position to produce sufficient hydrogen from uh, renewable energy alone to meet the demand for some time. Um, that is uh, why there is a, a multi-track approach and funding uh, by the government for not only large-scale demonstration of electrolysis uh, to produce green hydrogen, but also to uh, demonstrate the integration of carbon capture with steam uh, methane reforming to produce um, blue hydrogen. Um, there are uh, also other other routes to hydrogen through uh, biomass reforming, photocatalysis, etc., which also um, will play an important role or could play an important role in the future. Um, what is important is the ability to scale up and, and drive down the costs as as Graham mentioned, the cost is is, is the, the Achilles heel uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, an important issue that is associated with the purity is the purity of the hydrogen uh, that's produced and therefore the type of conversion technology which is used, whether that be combustion or low temperature or high temperature fuel cell technology. A lot of issues around um, uh, the cleanup and and uh, and making acceptable 
um, quality hydrogen for those applications. There is, um, so I think there's a great opportunity for hydrogen to play an important role in decarbonization of energy use in our buildings, in transport and by industry. But I don't think it should be thought of as, as, as adopting a hydrogen economy in isolation. I think the real advantage comes when it's adopted as an important energy vector within an integrated energy system. So there is potential to have a, an integrated hydrogen and electricity system which can improve our uh, efficient and effective use of energy. Um, the interconnection between these energy vectors will appear as a, a number at a number of points in an energy system. Um, there is a connection, obviously, through the use of uh, renewable electricity from PV, wind, to produce green hydrogen, to electrolysis, and the opportunity this provides to um, to give us uh, medium to long term energy storage. This creates the uh, possibility to maximize the use of renewable electricity generated. The hydrogen can be utilized for heating for domestic and commercial buildings and for industrial processes. It can be used as a transport fuel, either directly or through the creation of uh, synthetic fuels, uh, ammonia, synthetic liquid fuels, for example, and the hydrogen can also be used to produce electricity itself through and feed into the grid. So there are kind of multiple connections between electricity and hydrogen um, works. Buildings can be heated using heat pumps and provided with a combination of electricity that's generated from renewables directly or by using hydrogen. Alternatively, buildings can be heated and provided with electricity using hydrogen fuel combining in power. We can have all transport vehicles with an electric powertrain and either using stored energy uh, in battery technology or from hydrogen. Um, and that will obviously depend on the duty. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm involved in at least two uh, demonstrations of hydrogen uh, vehicle uh, technology in, uh, in other countries. Um, the multiple combinations of power to hydrogen and hydrogen to power will allow us to maximize renewable energy and will provide resilience and flexibility in the whole energy system. Um, one of our research programs at uh, in Durham Energy Institute, I forgot to mention that I'm uh, chair of energy systems at Durham University, um, is in the design and development of an integrated hydrogen and electricity energy hub for buildings, transport and industry. Um, this is, uh, has recently been funded, this research work. This links to our work in the National Centre for Energy Systems Integration and our leading of two UK networks on hydrogen transportation and the decarbonisation of heating and cooling. Um, we're involved in the research in the production, storage, distribution and use of hydrogen through our work in material science, um, electrolysis fuel cells, for example, through to policy, um, consumer acceptance, safety. Uh, all of these are really, really, uh, and also the economics, uh, really important aspect of, of the maximizing the utilization of hydrogen. Um, we are a partner in the 12.7 million pound INEX uh, National Grid project that was announced yesterday that, uh, that Keith uh, mentioned, and also uh, working with uh, Northern Gas Networks on the integral demonstration. So uh, that's my, uh, my uh, few points on, on hydrogen and the, the future use of hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, looking in the chat box, uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, dialogue um, from a question from Johan. I think it would be worth sort of 
uh, summarising this for people in general. Uh, Johan's question was, the IEA has recently published a report that indicates that sufficient hydrogen to fully decarbonise the steel industry will not be available until about 2070. What is the situation for the UK with respect to hydrogen availability, considering that we all need to chain, charge our Teslas and heat our houses with green electricity as well? Um, Chris McDonald, you originally answered this. Would you like to comment first? Yes, happy to, Sue. Um, so I think, I think Johan raised a really good point, which is about the availability of electricity. And this isn't just from the perspective of hydrogen, but just generally, um, if we were to decarbonise our economies via electrification, um, the amount of electricity required isn't really taken into account. And it's not just about generation, it's also about grid infrastructure. Um, so there are ways that hydrogen can help with this. Um, so we heard about um, the use of hydrogen in domestic boilers. There is currently some debate raging about this in the UK because people quite rightly point out that it's generally um, more energy efficient to use electricity directly rather than hydrogen. But that doesn't take into account how you would get the fuel to the home in the first place and also the positive role of hydrogen as an energy storage uh, medium and the fact that it's when it's in the uh, gas pipelines, it's, there is a storage regime as well. There are many reasons why you would use hydrogen for home heating. Um, but the point I made in the chat was also about the role of carbon capture and storage. So I've said that TSI currently produces 50% of the UK's hydrogen. That's produced by a steam methane reformers. Um, and the connection of the steam methane reformers to a carbon capture and storage network uh, creates a, a carbon neutral solution uh, for hydrogen production, which doesn't re require electricity. Uh, Gareth, you made a response to this question as well. Would you like to summarise that? Yeah, I, I think there's two points, and I think really what Chris has said is effectively sound. That you know, there is a lot of gas around. The, if you like, the joining up of hydrogen production reformation. I've, I've actually referred to an advanced thermal reformer, which is a kind of more recent take on the SMR, which is currently what's used on T side. And to put it simplistically, the difference between the two is the steam methane reformer is effectively catching the CO2 product from breaking down the natural gas to hydrogen and carbon dioxide, but it's not catching combustion gas. The way the alter thermal reformer works, it's all done in a single stage, so you get a much higher CO2 efficiency. I think it's about 94% capture. So again, it's not 100. So that that is the, the technology. The alternative way to make hydrogen would be huge amounts of electricity, vast banks of electrolyzers with all the points that Graham made in terms of reliability. There's also a piece of literature out there which looks at the world's supply chain ability to resource manufacture of electrolyzers, and it kicks out the availability of the kind of scale you need to plus 50, plus 70 years. It's some colossal number. So I think if we wanted to... Have we had access to sufficient electrolyzer capability, you know, you know, capacity? We would have to wait many, many decades before we could actually do it that way. And ATR technology is with us now, and steam methane reformers is very, very common. So I think that's the, that's really the only way we're going to see large quantities of hydrogen, you know, available in the short term. I think Thank you. Uh, if I just chip in with that. I, 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 I tend to agree with that, I think, um, albeit that from our perspective, we, we want to see lots of all of it, green, blue, and so on. Um, I think what, what's interesting to me is that there's quite often this discussion around, well, where, where on earth are going to come from and how do we do that? Uh, and I always find that quite a fascinating question because nobody ever seems to ask that of oil or gas. They just assume it's there, right? Um, and and I, I, I think that's important because the reason that we have the oil production that we have now and the reason that we have the natural gas production we've got now is because the demand was there. Consumers wanted those products. Um, and what we're talking about here is a, is a, is a, a, a monumental shift in, in, in the, the energy portfolio, that even in the UK, that we would have. You know, I presented that chart at the beginning there, which showed, you know, broadly speaking, something like a six, six and a half, I think it was, um, 
uh, uh, terawatt hour day, so every single day. That's the sort of order of magnitude that we're dealing with here. Um, uh, and what we're talking about is we're not going to use oil anymore by 2050, by and large. Uh, we're not going to use natural gas, uh, 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 unabated natural gas uh, uh, by 2050 by the same token. So something has to fill that void. Uh, it would be an astonishing feat to build that amount of electrical generation from renewables because you'd have to over capacity, you'd have to have over capacity to get anywhere near that. And not least the incredible amount of infrastructure, upheaval, what's ripped off the full thing in order to deliver that at that scale before we even start talking about storage and resilience. So I think that's why there has to be a hydrogen solution to this. So therefore, that's where the demand is. And when we're talking about demand on the heat side, just the heat side alone, you're into gigawatts of generation on a daily basis without batting an eyelid. Uh, then you layer on top the opportunities around transport and the heavy industries. That's where the demand is, that's where the opportunity is. And that's why production will rise to that challenge. It has to, because if it doesn't, we'll be here in 30 years time, still on oil and gas and electricity, thinking how the heck do we do net zero? Um, so it's it, there's just not a do nothing option. Uh, and, and you'll appreciate that report from the steel industry saying there won't be enough, but there has to be because, you know, we still want steel, we're still gonna need that, uh, and we want that to be decarbonized. Uh, and the UK has set that 2050 target. So, so I think it's, I, I'm really optimistic that there are solutions out there. I'm aware of technologies looking at uh, hydrogen production, which are uh, based on natural gas, but knocking knocking on the door of 98%. And they're now driving that, that new technology to say, let's hit the 100% because our efficiencies are so very high, we can afford to sacrifice a bit of that at the exp uh, so that we get all of the carbon out of that product. So, you know, uh, th this challenge we face, I think, is driving fantastic new innovation. Uh, I've been hearing briefings on appliances, cookers, fires, and so forth, where uh, what they're saying to us is the efficiency of those appliances is higher than you see with natural gas. And they've been engineered in such a way that the NOx levels are much, much lower. So that's an incredible news story of, of kind of UK engineering, really, of technology. So, so I think you know that there are issues to, to to overcome, but I think I'm really optimistic that we have we have the right capability, certainly in the UK, to do that. Okay, uh, thank you very uh, much. Sorry, so I was I think I, I think there's something to add. I think Johan's spot on, really, that the amount of hydrogen you'd have to make to uh, support steelworks is unthinkable really at the moment the investment required because what what you'd do is you'd, you'd still take the gas out of the ground so you'd still have to drill the hole you'd still need the gas plant you'd still need all the gas pipelines then you've got to invest in the hydrogen capacity and the carbon capture capacity to be able to get to that point so the capital cost is enormous so therefore the cost of the fuel is enormous so therefore the cost of the steel is enormous so our, our demand would go down because we wouldn't be able to afford it for a lot of stuff. And, and, and I think it's a combination of how do you link together the ability to, to use less stuff? Because really, we waste so much of what we process, is what Tony was touching on, that, that the efficiency of the system, the resource efficiency of the system needs to come very, very high up the way we think about things. And we can solve these these things technically. It's, we we know we can do that. We can always solve them technically, but socially and economically, they're significantly more challenging. And if we want to carry on doing what we do at the moment, we're going to have to have a a really big rethink of of the way we go about doing it. Because even if we started building the best reformer we could think of now, to get to the point of making all the steel that's made every year in a carbon free version building continuously from now on will take us at least 20 years and that's probably a pretty optimistic view and we actually can't afford to do it either because we've got other things that are worrying us and taking our money at the moment okay thank you graham uh, i had a point raised by ian welburn uh, who says he, he agrees 
uh, with what's been said before, uh, there's a lot of talk of storage and explosion risk, but the effects on the wider environment, particularly NOx, are pretty big ticket items to address. Uh, he knows the Australians are looking at hydrogen and graphite generation from anaerobically generated biogas, uh, which he started to look into. Uh, sorry, I've lost my place now. The screen moved. Uh, but the energy balance is a lot less efficient than natural gas. The technology employed is often driven by wider intentions than just the end use, though. Uh, I'm just looking down to see if we've got any other questions. Uh, quite a few comments back from uh, various other people. Uh, Bob Freely says he's authored a paper submitted to BEIS June this year, which reviews the technologies. Uh, it will be appended to a reply in the call for evidence by UK 2070 Friday this week. I hope you find it interesting. Um, uh, Johan's coming back saying, if we use all this electricity in the future to make green hydrogen, why not use that electricity to crack CO2 from carbon capture and fully close the carbon loop? Uh, Graham, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, it's, I'm going to sli take a slightly different tack here. That, that biological point is quite an important one. We, we neglect what evolution's done in the way we think about a lot of these things. And I think I think the trouble with the biological processes is they tend to be ambient, they tend to be fairly inefficient, and they also tend to produce lots of carbon dioxide, actually. But but we can learn a lot from the way biological systems work. And if we can link together biological systems with our non-biological systems, then I think there's huge opportunities in that. And there's still, in my mind, still the best thing you can do with carbon dioxide is grow plants. And and there's no there's no reason why we shouldn't, rather than think of technology solutions that involve compressors and purification systems and digging holes and burying stuff, and why we don't think much more creatively about why don't we have massive aeroponic farms attached to our crackers and our power stations and and stuff because that's closing the loop up. It's actually learning from from biology, and I think there's more, a lot more of that we can do than we do at the moment. But uh, the problem still is, like I say, that nearly all these biological processes do make carbon dioxide because that's just the way chemistry works. <laughs> okay, thank you, Graham. Uh, I have a question here from Bob Freely, uh, who wants to discuss sector coupling. Uh, Bob, would you like to unmute your microphone and ask the question directly? And who is it directed to? Thanks, Sue. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. We've got it's a now. general discussion with the panel, uh, all the panel, really. I, I note that the European Union, Germany, Australia and Norway have already uh, issued and discussed the national hydrogen strategies. The uh, uh, And people have been touching on here about the difficulties associated with finance and, this, and scale. Uh, and there's been some um, discussions about public and private sector coupling. Um, but I think it's also technological coupling. I can envisage a um, four to six energy stroke steel stroke manufacturing hubs in the UK, with Teesside being one of them, uh, depend, depending on expertise in the areas. Um, uh, and it's interesting for me that uh, Germany have kicked this off with nine to ten billion, nine to ten thousand million dollars. So people have got to start wrapping their head round about the scale uh, uh, of the challenge and the scale of the monies required here, because that's that that sets the tune for 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 for, for, for the, the the amount and types uh, of um, industries going forward and how they coupled together so i don't think it's inconceivable that you would have a, a green hydrogen production plant with a green electrical power producer 
with a green steel plant, all operated uh, with some conjunction of public and private sector ownership. Now, there's a lot more discussion, isn't there, that, that would ensue with that. But um, we, we um, I mean, I, I work at the moment for a company called Farmer Engineering Consulting, who was tar who were made up of ex Tata Steel Consulting and ex McClellan and Partners um, engineers. Uh, and we're going to submit a paper to UK 2070 for ID this week. And so, and, and some of these ideas and discussion points around sector coupling are in that paper. So I hope people find that interesting. And, the, and, and appended to that paper is going to be a review of the technologies that we, that, that we came across from proton exchange membranes and olefiber membranes mm -hmm. with, with, with producing the hydrogen gas. The um, for me, it's a step change in the thinking here, and we're going to launch into a new phase of human endeavour, which, I mean, people use this word unprecedented now, don't they, a lot, but it is going to be, I think. So it was just to, to, to add this discussion point and food for thought around sector coupling. Thanks, Sue. Okay, and uh, would any of the speakers like to comment on that? Don't all shout at once. Uh, I, I really agree. I think um, the sort of noises we're hearing in Europe uh, are, are very, very positive. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking in, they're talking in, in hundreds of billions of investment. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and you know, what we're seeing is, you know, Germany, for instance, uh, what, six to eight weeks ago, I think it was, perhaps a little longer, they announced that they were developing their hydrogen backbone, which is to uh, convert their, they, they, they operate two national transmission systems, in effect, they've got one that runs on H gas, one on L gas, as they call it, uh, so effectively one's Russian gas and one's uh, gas from Holland, I think. Uh, and the, because the Groningen field in Holland has been shut down, they're now looking to convert that that asset, a very significant asset, across to hydrogen. Uh, so they've, they've put forward a scheme to do all of that work that they're working on now uh, with a pipeline connection across into the UK. These, these things are not uh, by any means low-cost projects, uh, uh, but nonetheless really exciting to see that sort of investment and indeed, the, 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 just the scale of, uh, of of ambition on the European side, and uh, I think it's absolutely right. This is a completely new era. It requires some really, really big, uh, uh, big thinking to be able to deliver it, and it will make. I just have the feeling it's going to make the previous industrial revolution of life elsewhere, because we're going, we, you know, to wean ourselves off, you know, centuries of fossil-based fuel for. You know everything that we do and move to to cleaner solutions is an extraordinary undertaking uh but you know that, that's just facts of opportunity for the uk to get stuck into it and, and I agree. yeah uh, maybe I, just just to add just to add a bit that that's so uh, just really responding from the kind of cluster view bob if you look at net zero t side so this is one dispatchable power station plus full capture you're looking at about 2.8 billion quid. And in terms of how that lot will be put to, put together and integrated, there is obviously a power station which is dis, which is dis, which is producing dispatchable electricity. So that's an investment proposition. There's a transmission and storage system, which is a separate investment proposition. Then the, you've got the transmission storage system you've got a potential commercial co2 disposal option and then on the back of that you can hang a commercial hydrogen production operation so there is there needs to be a way through actually putting the necessary business models and risk sharing mechanisms in place such that that can and that is the kind of parallel technology parallel challenge but in many ways it's a bigger one because we're engineers, this is about building stuff, is what we do. But the challenge is making this investable. And this is what the government's got its key piece to play, which is actually providing the necessary incentives, business models, 
economic environment for business such as this can actually happen by itself. Agreed, agreed. But when, um, when, when there's some um, turning points in history, isn't there, where, where political affiliations get put to one side uh, and actually the circumstances of the day start creating new forms of political ideas. And, and, and I believe that, that that's a position we're at at the moment. So uh, it would have been inconceivable, wouldn't it? 70s, 80s, laissez-faire capitalism for public sector um, investment. But if you look what's been going on now, the, um, the government for 12 months, um, it, it, you know, propped up Scunthorpe Steelworks. The, the, they're propping up the, 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 the economy at the moment with furlough monies. So you can put whatever title you like on that and, and you can stay away from the emotive ones, <laughs> whether it's socialism uh, or, or, or whatever. But the, 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 the public's, and they're investing a lot, it, 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 well, the rest investing some in the UK. I wouldn't say a lot in relative terms but, uh, with, with the rest of you. So the, um, and, and there's a need, isn't there, on the back of COVID to raise revenue. So you, you got the usual arguments uh, uh, of tax. And now uh, Mr. Sunak is, is, is talking about things he thinks are novel, like uh, road tolls and things. But the, the, the government uh, would benefit from uh, revenue from a, 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 a new green industry. It's just how it's sorted out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and, and how, how, how you get to the business model. So yeah, the, uh, I, I, that's worth further discussion. Yeah. I think that works in a way. The government is going to have to subsidise the business models very, very hard for quite a while. And the government's going to have to put some skin in the game to actually say they really support this. And the government's going to have to demonstrate a consistency of view. Because if not, people are not going to invest. They will do. They will take the easy option, which is to offshore industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, we, and we all see that happening plenty of times. So that's really the great. The, you know, the engineering is easy. The political. It's the political challenge here. We've got to be able to give them some money back. In, in the going. So whether 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 in the for their investment. I mean, I don't know what time frame you put on short, medium, and long term now. But it, you know, then. At reasonably long, short and medium terms, uh, the government can enjoy some revenue for their investments from uh, the, the, the sale of, of the hydrogen gas, the sale of the electricity and the, the, the sale of the green steel for the UK decarbonisation. And in each of them three areas, you can export this material as well, can't you, you know? So there's, there's the, because it's unfair to... And, and, and not doable for, for, for private industry on its own to finance this. So the only thing that is really going to kickstart this off, which Germany and other people have recognised, is some sort of sector coupling. Chris. Thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to uh, change the emphasis slightly. We've had a question from Paul uh, asking about... Uh, Blast furnaces. Uh, Chris has indicated he would like to respond to this. Yes, yeah, so I think Paul raises a good point, which is if we're going to have a CCS network, a hydrogen production, then why wouldn't we just connect the carbon capture and storage directly to the blast furnace and not have the hydrogen reduction at all? Um, and I think the answer to that, Paul, is essentially that um, for most people don't realise it, and Steve Pallant on the call probably doesn't want to hear it, but the blast furnace has sort of had a really good innings over the last few hundred years, um, but it's currently being superseded by more advanced technology around the world. Um, and so some people may have seen the announcement just in the last couple of weeks from Big River Steel in the US that they've completed an expansion of their uh, electric arc furnace mini mill, which has boosted their productivity to 5,000 tonnes per employee, which is why they can pay their employees on average $148,000 a year. And that's five times the productivity of an equivalent blast furnace plant in Europe. So there is, with a mini mill on your doorstep, there is no conceivable way that a blast furnace can compete with it in terms of productivity. And you might be sat there thinking, well, the, the mini mill can't make the same quality. Uh, but Big River have also announced um, in the last week that they're now making advanced high strength steels for the automotive market as well. Um, and so 
blast furnace operators who are looking at their furnaces thinking, well, we need to replace these for reasons of carbon, also need to replace them for reasons of economic productivity as well. And I think this is why, even though China has the youngest fleet in bla blast furnaces in the world with an average age of only 14 years, we're seeing the first hydrogen DRI plant in the world going into China. Because I'm sure what we'll see in China, as we've seen before in China, is that when the technology shifts, the Chinese aren't quite so wedded to their invested capital and they're happy to move quickly um, to new technology. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we seem to have dried up with questions in the chat box now, so I'd like to ask one. Um, one of the things that's been mentioned is the prospect of ge uh, generating hydrogen using renewable energy and then storing the hydrogen and using it to um, generate electricity when demand uh, arises. In other words, using it essentially as just a big battery. What's the relative efficiency of a battery versus doing that? Uh, and I'm not sure who'd be best qualified to answer that one. Any volunteers? Yeah, I'll start the discussion off soon. Say first of all, I don't know the absolute numbers, but I think it's safe to say that converting it with the, you know, converting electrons to gas and then back again is going to be horribly inefficient. And the other side to that is once you've converted that to green hydrogen, you've got a very very pure hydrogen, and you're in a different order of magnitude for purity to the kind of stuff you're going to get out the back end of a SMR or ATR. So I would add that if you've got green hydrogen story and use it for um, fuel cell applications and transport. I, I was just going to uh, I was going to come at that from a, uh, a slightly different approach. Um, I too don't know the, the efficiency, so I'm not going to. No, I can't really answer that one. But what I would say is, I think there's there are two separate things here. Uh, if, if you need some short-term rapid response storage, you absolutely should be using a, some sort of battery system for electricity. Um, that I, I can't think of a possible reason why you would want to convert it to hydrogen in that instance. Uh, but if you need something that is uh, uh, longer term, perhaps more seasonal, uh, uh, that has uh, incredible levels of resilience and indeed uh, can sit there for many years and pretty much what you've put in is what you're going to get back out at the end of it, then a battery isn't the right approach uh, because that will degrade even if you do nothing with it. Uh, and, and hydrogen probably is. Or some other other means of converting that energy into something that will store safely for a long time. So it's, it's about the practical use of storage and what you're trying to do with it rather than uh, the, the efficiency in the first instance because there are it's it's finding the right solution for the situation that you're in. So, so I'll tell you what the New Zealanders did that I alluded to just before. What, what they they were looking at um, remote communities basically that were importing lots of energy, and and they what they put in was they put in a, a small wind turbine, a set of solar cells, a big battery which was a lead acid battery in this particular instance, <laughs> the most basic electrolyzer you've ever seen, which was just nickel foam. Uh, that you could put a current across with water around it uh, and what they did was they used the wind and the sun to charge the battery up when the battery was full they switched the electrolyzer on and the electrolyzer made hydrogen which they stored under the ground in, in big 10 inch pipes at three bar so no pressurization or depressurization buried um, and then they converted a Worcester Botch boiler to run on hydrogen but they converted it from AC to DC and they converted all their heating systems from AC to DC, so they didn't lose, they didn't have no transmission losses and exchange losses. Uh, and it worked beautifully. And, and it, it, I mean, it's not going to work on a, a city scale, but, but it would certainly work on a distributed scale. And the technology was so basic that it really couldn't go wrong, and it didn't. And and it's just that way of think, thinking slightly differently about it so you just store as much as you can of the energy you've got i mean being being new zealanders they also got converted their, their barbecue to be a hydrogen barbecue as well <laughs> i think in in terms of the um the the conversion efficiency it, it, it's it is pretty low we're talking about um 
12, 10 percent or something like that. I changed off the top of my head. But I guess the thing is as well um, that um, it's not the, the efficiency is very often not that so important as you would think. If you're looking at for a grid scale energy storage, um, it's actually the it's the investment property proposition uh, that is is paramount, not not the actual efficiency. Um, so, if there can be the advances in the, the technology to reduce the cost, um, it, for example, in, in compression of, of hydrogen, there's an enormous amount of loss in, in gas compression. Um, but there's there's, a, there's new technology, new methods. There's a new project that I'm involved in that hopefully will start in a couple of months' time. That is looking at recovering that energy loss within the whole process. So looking at it uh, as a whole system rather than an individual components of it. So that there are there are advances that could be made. And then the other thing is that we when we talk about hydrogen purity, so you need 99.999% purity of hydrogen for a PEM fuel cell. But there are lots of other types of fuel cell. We, we, we tend to think of fuel cells as being um, the ones that we know because they're in they're they're in their small scale and they're in they're in, uh, in vehicles. But um, you know, high, high temperature fuel cells, uh, molten carbon and solid oxide fuel cells, for example, um, the purity doesn't need to be high. You don't have to even you can actually feed them with um, uh, direct methanol or, or or methane or whatever. So there, there are different options there until, and again, when I when I said I think we have to think about a transition. We're not going to we're not going to solve this whole decarbonisation uh, overnight. By we just basically got to use everything that we have in our armory to to move towards a, the the transition to net zero. Um, the other point is that um, that kind of leads on to what. Um, what Graham was talking about earlier as well is that we also need to do this hand in hand with reduction of energy demand. We have to do that. There's no point switching to use hydrogen when you still waste 30, 40, 50 percent of that energy within that process, um, which you, you get in, in, in lots of uh, processes at the moment using natural gas. We also have to link this in with a circular economy. We must. We must um, uh, build that into our, our production of, of materials um, and link our supply chain, our value chain with the, the, the material production in the first place and, and have a and link that back. And that's the only way that we're ever going to, to um, reach this 2050 target. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Tony. Uh, one final question from uh, Keith Lewis. Uh, are we doing enough to ensure that we have the necessary skilled resources, technical and project, in Teesside to be the hydrogen hub of the UK? Lots of subject matter event experts required. Are we ready with a young, energised, passionate workforce? Uh, there's been a bit of response to this on the chat, but um, initially, uh, if Keith would like to respond to that one, and we'll make this the last question. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I put a little note in the, the chat there that uh, from a, a DB gas industry perspective, uh, EU skills, have, they're, they're working on some competencies for, uh, uh, for hydrogen, and what that would do is then plug in those modules into the existing schema for gas safe engineers. So, so it's positive that we've got this first uh, first development that will create the, the competencies, create the training and so forth. But you know that's that's a really small part of what is a a, a big piece of work from a from a, a broader industry perspective. Uh, the, the sort of stats that I hear from a, 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 a I sit with uh, my, one of my institutes is IGM Institute Gas Engineers and Managers, um, and and some of the numbers about skills shortfalls in the UK from an engineering and technical perspective are just the crazy numbers really, uh, and something has to change if the UK is to, you know, uh, not just maintain but actually uh, expand its its 
its its presence in these areas. So uh, uh, it's absolutely right to to, to raise this uh, because it doesn't matter how good our technology is or how good our businesses are. If we don't get the uh, 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 people coming in and being attracted to the joining our industries, then we will fail. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 good to have that raised. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Chris, would you like to make a comment on that? Chris McDonald, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm sorry, so I was just sorry, so I was just uh, uh, just unmuting. Yeah, so this this point about skills is well made, but I think another thing that we need to consider as well is that is understanding what skills that that we need for the future and being prepared for the fact that actually we can't fully anticipate what those skills are. Because at the same time as the decarbonisation revolution that's happening, we're also going through the fourth industrial revolution in terms of new digital technologies. There are new technologies that are being developed and deployed and, and continually in such a way that you know we can't say to um, school leavers what the skills that will be required in 10 years' time. So my view is that we need to invest also in lifelong learning and helping people continually to make a transition from one technology to another throughout their career. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Gareth, would you like to add anything? I'm just going to say, yes, I agree. It's one. Of, it's going to be one of the challenges of the future as industry change from what they are now to the future. But equally, we're not, we need not to lose sight the fact that a lot of the kind of skills we're operating a process chemical plant, we now operate an hydrogen plant. So it's not, in some ways, I think, the greatest gulf, but as long as we've got that core pipe of people coming through. And that sometimes worries me about just how much of a pipe of people we have got going through and, that, and the kind of people we're attracting and want to attract to the industry, which I think takes us back to the, you know, the challenge we all know well, attracting the right calibre of people and keeping them in engineering. Yeah. OK, Tony Ruskilly, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, this is, we recognise this point and um, fairly recently we put into uh, a request to Treasury for um, for funding to, um, uh, for a skills centre um, uh, in, in Teesside um, and that would be jointly with uh, Teesside University and also another skills centre over in, uh, in the north west with um, uh, Chester University, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really, really important. And, and but the thing is that it's going to um, require quite a lot of money to actually incentivize and and get those um, skill centres set up. Okay, Graham Hillier, do you want the last word? I think I think I think it's mostly been said, but I do think it's a lifelong learning thing, and I do think I think a lot of the basic techniques we're taught when we're at university and how to analyze flows and processes and stuff it doesn't really matter what fluid you're looking at it's uh, and the capital costs and all of those kinds of things are things that we perhaps need to teach ourselves more about but but it's not that i mean this isn't difficult this isn't different engineering from what's what's gone before it's just applied in a different way okay thank you very much well at that point, I'd like to thank everybody for taking part, especially our panel of Chris McDonald, Gareth Fletcher, Keith Owen, Graham Hillier and Professor Tony Ross Gilly. Thank you very much for giving up your time and your wisdom uh, and helping us with this discussion. Uh, if anybody has any queries or wants to be put in touch with anybody, uh, please get in touch with me and I can pass anything on. Uh, we have recorded this. Uh, and it should be available soon on the CIE YouTube site. And again, if you're not on the CIE mailing list, then please um, get in touch with me and I can pass on the link to you. So I think it only remains for me to say good night to everybody. Uh, wish you all well and please take care. Good night, one and all. <laughs>